In Matthew 24, Jesus' disciples asked him about the end of the world, the signs of his coming, and the signs that things were going to be at an end. And in verse 12, it reads that because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. And this is really what I want to focus on today, and that is how do we keep our love, the love that God gives us, the love for him and the love for others, how do we keep that warm? I suppose in some different ways we, we can't do that. We need to rely on Jesus uh, through prayer. It is that work that he does in our hearts. But you know, we get very accustomed to what is evil, don't we? In Ezekiel chapter 9, verse 4, we're looking at a time, Ezekiel is being given a vision of these men that are going through the city, the city of Jerusalem, with destroying weapons in their hands. But before they go through, one of them is sent through, and God tells him that, that he is going to put a mark on the foreheads of everyone that, that does sigh and cry for all of the evils that they see. In other words, it's really getting to them inside what they are seeing. And so I just bring this forward to you now that we need to be careful that our love would stay warm before Christ. In this verse, uh, in Matthew 24, verse, verse 12, it says, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Now, when we think of love, most people would say, well, if they love someone or something. They have a kind of love within them. But in this framework, when it says, because iniquity abounds, the love of many will wax cold. This is really talking about God's love. This is talking about right and wrong as a part of it. Because God's love is not just about warm and tender feelings. It has to do with righteousness, justice, and that type of thing also. And so you can see, you know, we are warned in Scripture in another place, in Isaiah. We are warned, woe to those who are calling evil good and good evil. Have you ever seen this today? Whether it is just in like a fiction movie or whether it's something in real life, where someone who has, been, who has committed a terrible crime is now kind of being made excuses for, oh, he had a terrible childhood, oh, he was abused, oh, he didn't have a father, oh, this reason, that reason. Or perhaps it's because, you know, the person he hurt did something to him first. And so in the end, then the person who is doing good would be called evil. But the person who has done the evil is really good. He's only evil because... Well, you understand what I'm saying. We see this a lot on television. We see it a lot represented in, in the media today, one way or the other. It's not always 100%. Once in a while, they get it right. But it's important to know something that, that we should watch out for, nonetheless. I think of this as it comes to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We see from the beginning of this, of course, Paul is writing to the church at Corinth. And he's rebuking them for a sin that he's become aware of, and that is fornication is going on, and there is a man having his father's wife. And not only have these Corinthians, I mean, the Corinthians aren't phased by this. It says, you are puffed up about this. Rather than rebuking it, you're supposed to be putting away this wicked person from you. But instead, they're, they're kind of pleased with, you know, their universal acceptance, their universal love of whatever is going on. This would be an example of such. And Paul is saying, look, you know, your, your eyesight is being switched around here. You need to see straight on to see what is evil and what is good. Another example that I had heard of this came, I'm sure it was above 10 years ago now, where I had heard of a Methodist minister who was performing a marriage for his son, his son was a homosexual and wanted to be married to his male partner. And of course, the Methodist minister was not allowed to do this by denominational, you know, instruction and by biblical instruction. But he did it anyway. He married his son to this other man. He performed the wedding, you know, for them. And of course, this is being covered in the news. And it's just like, oh, this minister is, is so noble for standing up for his son. And these people who would refuse this love between the two men are just so terrible. I mean, there was this contingent. It wasn't entirely lopsided. It was so long ago, I can't remember it exactly. 
But you know, Jesus said, he that loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And obviously, if the minister was going along with this evil, that he was clearly meant to be set against, you know, he's in the wrong. I mean, he he's, he's going along with this uh, homosexuality of his son to get along with family relations, exactly what Jesus warned us about in Matthew chapter 10. And so here it is where, again, evil is being called good, good is being called evil. We can see this now. And so what it is, is that we really must turn from our sins. We have to say it honestly, comparing it in God's word. This is one way in which we need to keep God's love warm in us by acknowledging what is truly good and what is truly evil, according to the word. But there's another place also. We remember that the Bible tells us that we should rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. And it's only appropriate. And even if something seems to be a right judgment, if something bad happens, say like it was in the book of Job. Remember, Job is, is chiding back at those main three friends saying, miserable comforters you are. You know, if, if, if I were in your place, I would be comforting the person who is down. But they weren't doing that. They were ripping on him. And then in another way, also, Jesus shows us, uh, just to finish that point, just to say, I mean, if evil comes on someone, we must be tender toward them. We can't just be throwing stones at them to increase, you know, their agony. We must mourn with those who mourn and rejoice with those who rejoice. And Jesus shows this in John chapter 11, when he raises Lazarus from the dead. Remember that shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept, John eleven thirty five. 35. He knew he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. If you read the testimony that he had before this event occurred, you know that was his plan. But he took time. He took time to mourn with those who were mourning and not just saying, Martha, cheer up. I'm here. Everything is going to be OK. He didn't just do that. So let us fight, brethren, in these last days to hold on to the warmth of God love, God's love, to give us discernment in every situation. I pray that God would bless this message to your edification. Have a good day in the Lord.